Hi, everyone, and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. My name is Chris Hudspeth. I'm the radio program manager for MS Focus Radio. And we're joined today by Dr. Herb, Herb Karpatkin, who will be talking to us about exercise during the summer months for persons with MS. After the presentation from Dr. Karpatkin, we're going to open it up to your questions and comments. And now I'm delighted to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Herb Karpatkin has been practicing physical, uh, a practicing physical therapist for over 30 years. He received his master's degree in physical therapy from Boston University and a doctorate in neurology from Rocky Mountain University. He is, a board, certif he is board certified in both neurologic physical therapy and in multiple sclerosis. He has held clinical posts at the Rusk Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine, Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, the International Multiple, Multiple Sclerosis Management Practice, and is currently an Associate Professor of Physical Therapy at Hunter College. He has presented nationally and published extensively on topics related to physical therapy and multiple sclerosis. He is also the owner of a small physical therapy practice specializing in treatment for persons with MS. And with that, uh, Dr. Karpatkin, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Hudspeth. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. Um, really grateful to the MS Foundation for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, and this is the kind of talk that I've been wanting to give for a while. It's one of those big problems in MS that people don't really pay enough attention to. And what I want to do is uh, try and maybe change the way you think about exercise in the summer. And what I want to start off with is a bit of a story that, well, this is actually a story that's happened to me many times. Uh, many years ago, before I started teaching full time, I had a rather large outpatient practice in New York City, where I'm from, which specialized in MS. And patients would come see me around August, early September, and they would say, no, oh, I'm sure I've just had an exacerbation. I'm sure my MS is getting worse. And my impression would be, no, they didn't have an exacerbation. Their MS didn't get worse. But because of the summer, they stopped exercising as much. They became much less active. And that made their symptoms worse. And after they were resumed exercise uh, in September, October, November, they would begin. Today is try to explain what's happening to you um, in for persons with MS during the summer, try and give you some suggestions as to how you can address it. But I'm only going to talk for about a half an hour, then I'd love to open it up for questions, because that's usually where these talks get the most, uh, get the most benefit. So I hardly have to tell the you guys out there that persons with MS struggle during the summer. Heat is the real enemy of people with MS, and it's not in your head. The problem is, is that when a demyelinated nerve heats up as a result of warm weather, conduction through that demyelinated nerve gets worse and worse and worse. And so the result of heat is that there's worsening of all major symptoms of MS, of MS during the summer months. Why is this a problem? Well, again, I'm sure you all know this. Your quality of life worsens. Your life is just not as much fun. And this is just what my patients have been telling me for years. Why does quality of life worsen? Because function worsens. Walking gets harder. Balancing gets harder. Even uh, reaching in a chair or rolling over in bed gets harder. Why does that happen? Because all the things that contribute to that strength, flexibility, sensation, they all get worse as a result of heat. Your ability to perform activity decreases, but it's not just the, it is not the disease getting worse. Let me uh, repeat that. 
the heat, whether it's from the summer or having a fever or from exercising, does not make the exercise worse. What happens is it makes your, the ability for you to move more difficult, which makes you more inactive. And it's that inactivity that makes you feel like the disease is getting worse. It's the lack of movement that is worsening the effects of the disease. And for this, I like to use the concept of primary loss and secondary loss in multiple sclerosis. So when we say somebody has primary loss, you know, primary fatigue or primary weakness, we say that's due to the disease. The primary loss is due to the fact that demyelination in the part of your brain or spinal cord that controls walking or strength or balance or flexibility is damaged because of the demyelination. That's primary loss. Secondary loss is something quite different. Secondary loss is due to the adaptations and compensations people make for the disease. So consider, say you have a damage to your spinal cord as a result of the MS and it makes, you, makes walking more difficult. So as a result of that, you walk less. Well, that makes the walking even worse, which makes you walk even less. Well, that makes the walking worse, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the damage that we see in multiple sclerosis is secondary, not primary. And that's actually good news because secondary means it's not due to the disease, it's due to the fact that Persons with MS generally don't move enough. They don't exercise enough. They're not active enough. And part of the reason for that is it's hard to be active with MS. It's hard to be physical. It's hard to do exercise. So once again, there's two types of losses that contribute to disability in MS. One is primary, the demyelination and inflammation in the brain and spinal cord. And one is secondary. The lack of movement results in a lack of fitness. Both contribute to the problems of MS, but the secondary is much more fixable, much more fixable, particularly by exercise and physical therapy. Here's a little graphic that I've made which shows the relationship to it. So consider primary loss. You can't walk because of lesions in your spinal cord or brain. The secondary loss is, as a result of those lesions, you walk less. So it becomes this vicious circle. Your movement is impaired, which leads to um, central nervous system damage, which makes your walking worse. You practice walking less, which makes your movement worse, which further impairs ambulation, so you practice less et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So there's this vicious circle which starts with the disease, but then it becomes, you walk less, which makes walking worse, which you walk less, which makes walking worse, et cetera. So the good news is so much of this is improvable okay. and as a physical therapist, I've been working in physical therapy for persons with MS for well over 30 years now. And there's zero doubt in my mind that people with, ex with MS who exercise, exercise hard and exercise in very specific ways, do much better than those who don't. And I could talk all day about the different benefits of exercise, but I wanna to try to narrow it down to a single slide today say there's sort of three distinct mechanisms by which exercise improves persons with MS. The first is overall improved mobility, or what I call task-specific practice. What that means is if you want to get good at something, you practice that something. If your walking is getting, getting bad and you want to get better at walking, you have to make yourself walk. 
if your balance is getting worse and you want to improve your balance, you have to practice balance. If your flexibility is getting worse and you want your flexibility to get better, you have to practice flexibility. The type of practice is going to dictate the type of improvements that you have. The second type of benefit of exercise and multiple sclerosis is what we'll call improved fitness or perhaps improved health and fitness. And this suggests that by exercising, you improve your overall health, wellness, weight stays down, um, your lungs are healthier, your heart is healthier, your, your circulation is healthier. Persons with MS or even persons without MS, if they exercise a lot, they will be healthier people than if they don't, regardless of the disease. The third point, though, is relatively new research which shows that persons with MS who exercise, regardless of the type of exercise, will have less MS active disease than those who don't. And this comes from studies uh, where they did autopsies or post-mortem analyses on patients with MS, and they compared the brains and spinal cords of persons who exercised to persons who didn't. And the persons who exercised had much less evidence of disease than those who did not exercise. They literally had bigger brains and bigger spinal cords. So this is pretty exciting. And the take home rule here is, is that there's lots of good reasons to exercise. There's no good reason to not exercise. The real question is how should we exercise? And specifically for today, how are you gonna exercise in during the hot weather of the summer. And this is the, to me, one of the fundamental problems of exercise and heat and MS. For anybody to achieve a benefit from exercise, whether it's a person with MS or a marathon runner or a weightlifter, you have to perform a certain volume or a certain dosage of exercise. You have to perform enough. Say somebody wants to run a marathon a 26 mile race. And they say, well, I'm gonna practice for this by training a half a mile a week. They'll never do it. The dosage is too small, the volume is too small. One of the ways I like to tell my patients to think about exercise and physical therapy is in the same way that a physician uses medication to treat multiple sclerosis, a physical therapist will use exercise in the same way a physician will use a certain type of exercise, a certain type of medicine and a certain dosage of medicine, a physical therapist will use a certain type of exercise and a certain dosage or volume of exercise. If you don't get to that volume, if you don't get to that dosage, the exercise will not be as effective. And the problem of thermosensitivity is it limits the ability of persons with MS to achieve that volume, to achieve that dosage. Why? Because exercise leads to heat buildup. When you exercise, your core temperature heats up and it decreases the ability for you to exercise as much as you can. Okay? So whether, the exercise, whether it's the exercise causing heat buildup or the temperature or both, it makes exercising hard. Now, one of, some of my patients will say, well, no matter how hard I push myself, excuse me, no matter how hard it is, no matter how bad the heat buildup is, I'm just gonna push myself. And that's at best ineffective and depressing, and at worst can lead to injuries because you can't break through that fatigue. The fatigue will break you instead because your body is simply no longer transmitting nerve impulses from your brain to your muscles. So what's the problem of summer and exercise? It's a double whammy. You have the external increase in exercise due to warm weather. You have the internal increase in temperature during exercise, but you need the exercise to control the effects of the disease and to limit progression of disability. And if you don't do the exercise, 
disability will progress because of the inactivity. Why is exercising during the summer even more important? Because of the problems that occur when you don't exercise. First, it's often very common for a lot of my patients to gain weight during the summer, not because they're eating more, but because they're not burning as many calories from exercise. Because of the heat, they just sit still. Another reason is muscle atrophy because the muscles aren't used the muscles get smaller and they're less able to produce the force needed for movement. Another reason is loss of flexibility. You need full range of motion to walk, to balance, to reach for things. If the muscles lose that flexibility, the, it becomes more difficult to go through the full range of motion to stand, to reach, to walk. The, if for the walking that you're doing, Persons with MS who often walk a lot during cooler weather, walk less over the summer, and they literally get worse at walking, not because the MS has gotten worse, but simply because they practice walking less. And finally, there's an increased falls risk during the summer. I get a lot of contacts from my patients telling me they're falling more during the summer, partially because of the heat, but also partially because they're not practicing their balance as much, so it's much easier for them to fall. So what can we do? Um, there's a lot of things we can do, and I'm just going to throw out some simple ideas and give some examples and try to present some evidence for things you could do to make sure you exercise during the summer. So I'm going to talk about five things, cooling vests, something called intermittent exercise, stretching exercises, postural exercises, and breathing exercises. I want to talk about cooling vests first. Um, it's a very, very simple idea. You put on a garment that's filled with ice packs and it cools you off. It lowers your core temperature during or before or after exercise. It will also lower your temperature in periods of, of heat. So it's a very simple thing to do before you need to exercise or before you need to move. You put on one of the cool vests and cool yourself off and maybe even leave it on while you're working. The best news here is you can get them for free. Yes, for free, you don't have to pay for them. The Multiple Sclerosis Foundation has a program by which the Cooling vests can be sent to you for free. I think you just need a note from your physician. And on the MSF website, you can find the information for it. Um, it's a great deal, and I advise anyone who has not taken advantage of it to do so. So what do you do with the cooling vests? Well, I'm very interested in pre-cooling that before somebody moves, they put the cooling vest on to cool themselves off. And because of that, it takes it longer for their core temperature to rise, either usually as a result of temperature or as a result of the environment. Um, some of my patients like to wear it during exercise, like when they go for a bike ride or when they're walking on the treadmill. So their core temperature when they start exercising takes longer to increase. And a lot of my patients like to wear it after exercise because they say it helps them recover from the exercise faster. I've had patients do all three of these, um, all seem to work of great interest. Um, I'm gonna go to skip a slide here and tell you about a study we're performing at Hunter College right now. And yes, the study is being funded by the MSF, which I'm very grateful for. Very simple study. We're taking persons with MS who are ambulatory. We have them come in and for 30 minutes, they wear a cooling vest. And then after those 30 minutes, they take the vest off and we ask them to walk as far as they can for six minutes. A week later, they come in and this time they sit for 30 minutes with no cooling vest. They just sit comfortably for 30 minutes and then they do the six minute walk. What we found so far, we've only collected data from about half our subjects so far, but when the subjects wore the cooling vest, they walked over 100 feet further over six minutes 
than if they didn't wear the cooling vest. So there was no training. There was no anything just keeping them cold while they walked. Okay? And it was interesting. Some subjects said they didn't feel like they walked any farther, but then we showed them that you know they improved from say walking 1200 feet to walking 1300 feet. So they were very surprised by this. Hopefully when this coronavirus thing ends, we'll get back to collecting data, but we're very excited about what we're finding so far. Okay. What about things other than cooling vests? My patients use all sorts of things. One of them keeps a bottle of ice cold water around them and they just sip it all day long, literally cooling themselves off from the inside. One patient of mine used to take cold showers during the day. He didn't particularly like cold showers, but he knew that he walked better afterwards. <clears throat> if you don't have an air conditioner, you should get one. Um, I do know of some cases that uh, insurance will sometimes pay for air conditioners if you can show them that you have MS and you need it. Um, dehumidifiers um, often have the same effect of air conditioners that if you take the humidity out of the room, excuse me, if you take the humidity out of the room, it has a similar effect. And there's other cooling garments like neck wraps, wrist wraps, etc., which can also do a good job of cooling you off. But the evidence that uh, cooling via any of these uh, techniques is done, it's going to help with movement. Okay, moving ahead. The next thing I want to talk about is something that I and my doctoral students at Hunter have done a lot of studies on, and that's called intermittent exercise. And there's nothing fancy about it. It's just interspersing periods of exercise with periods of rest. In other words, rather than exercising continuously without a break, you exercise, rest, exercise, rest, exercise, rest. Why does this work? because during the rest periods, you recover. Why do you recover? Because your heat's not building up. So rather than walking, say, for 10 minutes without a break, I'll tell my patients, walk two minutes, rest two minutes. Walk two minutes, rest two minutes, etc. The result of this is it allows for a much greater volume or dosage of exercise to be performed. So let me give you a favorite story of mine from a few years ago. A patient of mine had this big goal of wanting to walk in the MS walk, um, which was a, at the time, a five kilometer walk. But she said she could barely walk more than 10 or 15 blocks. So we started practicing in walking. She'd walk for five blocks, rest, walk for five blocks, rest, walk for five blocks, rest, walk for five blocks, rest. And she practiced this for months. Well, on the day of the MS walk, that's just what she did. She'd walk for a few blocks and she would, her husband brought a little uh, uh, folding chair with him and she'd sit down and rest, sit and walk, you know, walk, walk for a few more blocks, sit and rest. And yes, I'm pleased to say she finished the walk and was not that uncomfortable by the end of it. So it's a very effective means of exercising and something that we've done a lot of studies of at Hunter. Here's an example of one of the studies which looks at not walking, but a repetitive exercise. We ask patients to perform SLRs. That stands for straight leg raise, and that's exactly what it sounds like. We ask the patient to lie on their back, raise their leg up, and then slowly lower it. We ask them to do it continuously or intermittently. The continuous group would raise their leg up and down once every three seconds. The intermittent group would do it two times in a row, but then they would rest for five seconds. Okay? And every subject would do both conditions a week apart. What we found is that the groups that did it continuously had to stop after 31 repetitions on the average. The group that took breaks could go for 114 repetitions. So you tell me, which group got more work done? The group that didn't take breaks or the group that did. Okay. So 
if walking is hard during the summer or if weight training is hard during the summer, okay, don't do it all at once. Break it up into smaller bits. Okay? So instead of walking for five minutes in a row, walk for one minute, then take a break and do that five times. Instead of doing three sets of 10 repetitions for strength training, do 10 sets of three repetitions and take breaks in between each set. During the rest, you can do things to help yourself too. You can use a cooling device like a vest, a cold drink. You can stretch your tight muscles out. Some of my patients have learned how to meditate during these rest breaks. They say it helps them relax and cool down. The important point here is the more work that you perform, the better. It's not how quickly you get the work done, but the total volume, the total dosage of work that makes the biggest, makes the biggest difference. The final message for intermittent exercise, the more you rest, the more work you can do. Okay, so let's move from intermittent exercise to stretching exercise. People don't, with MS don't realize how important stretching is. Um, and the loss of flexibility that occurs as a result of summer immobility can make walking much harder. The nice thing about stretching is the stretching exercises can be done fairly comfortably without building up of a lot of heat. I suggest to a lot of my patients, even the ones who are really immobile, that they should intersperse periods of immobility with short rest breaks. And I'll give you some examples of stretching exercises. But one other thing about stretching, uh, this is a common conversation I have with patients. A patient will come up to me and they'll say, ah, oh, Herb, you know, I've tried stretching. It didn't really work. It didn't really help me at all. And they say, well, how much do you stretch? And they say, oh, I stretch a lot, about 30 seconds, two or three times a week. This is once again a dosage problem. 30 seconds three times a week is not enough. I'm thinking more 5, 10, 15 minutes every day of the week. But the idea is to get yourself into a comfortable position where your muscles are being stretched and simply hold that position as long as you comfortably can. So I want to show a few examples of stretches you could do while sitting down. They really couldn't be easier and don't take a lot of energy. Here's a hamstring stretch. The hamstring refers to the muscle at the back of your thigh. It gets very tight in persons with MS as a result of prolonged sitting. So what this person is doing is they're just sitting forward in their chair. They're putting their tight leg on the floor, landing on the heel with the toe up, and then they just sort of lean into the hip. And I'm sure this person would be feeling the stretch all along here in the back of their hip. <coughs> That's a hamstring stretch. This is a hip flexor stretch. This stretches the muscle on the top of the thigh, which also gets really, really tight in persons with MS and interferes in walking. And all she's doing here is she's sitting in the chair with the left leg that she wants to stretch. She's sort of putting it behind her. So now she's feeling a stretch all down the front of her leg. And again, for something like that, I recommend you hold that stretch for 30 to 60 seconds several times a day, seven days a week. Okay, here's a calf stretch. Calf muscles get really tight in persons with MS. Done in sitting, this fella just wrapped a towel around the ball of his foot and he's pulling up. And here's a low back stretch done in sitting. Person's just leaning forward. Okay. All these are stretches of muscles that can get really tight with prolonged sitting. Okay, the next type of exercise I want to call postural exercise. Persons who sit too much tend to develop very poor posture, which makes movement more difficult. It leads to tightness of the muscles of the check of the chest and the interior and the interior neck. It leads to weakness of the muscles of the black back and weakness of the muscle of the shoulder blade. It leads to a forward head, which is terribly common in MS. Here you see three different seated postures. And this fella here is a very typical forward head. You see under normal conditions like this, the head should be right over the shoulders. Over here, the head is forward of the shoulders. And 
here the head is looking down at the shoulders. Here you can also see he's very flexed at the low back and has a big hump over here called a thoracic kyphosis. <coughs> People who sit too much, and this happens a lot in MS, have a lot of trouble with posture. And when I see somebody who's been sitting too much and developing poor posture, it's often one of the first things I work on. What happens as a result of poor seated posture? You get low back pain, mid back pain, neck pain. Your ability to move in sitting to reach over the side or reach forward gets worse. And also more importantly, it makes breathing more difficult because it closes off the amount of air space for breathing. Because of specifically this position here, the amount of room that his lungs have to fill with air is decreased and leads to worsening of breathing as a result. So here's a super easy postural exercise. I recommend it to all my patients. All you're really doing is pinching your shoulder blades together. The fancy name for it is scapular retraction. I just call it the shoulder blade pinch. All you're doing, pull your shoulder blades together, try to make them touch in the back. Hold that pinch for the count of five while inhaling, and then slowly relax your shoulder blades while exhaling. <coughs> It's a very easy exercise and can really help improve posture. Here's another favorite postural exercise of mine, and this is to stretch out the front of the neck and the front of the chest. It decreases the forward head. It stretches the neck muscles over here. It also strengthens the muscles in the back of the neck, but more important is it really opens up your chest, gives your lungs more room to advance, to, to enlarge and that will make breathing more easy. Okay. The next exercise I want to talk about is breathing exercise. Uh, in a lot of the research that I performed and read, it seems that problems with breathing is one of the common, most common issues leading to morbidity and mortality in MS. As a result of this immobility, the amount of work that the heart and the lungs have to do gets decreased. And when they need to do work, their heart has trouble supplying blood to the muscles. The lungs have trouble supplying oxygen. Okay. So very often persons with MS, particularly after being inactive for long periods of time, have poor cardiovascular health or increased cardiovascular disability. And once again, this vicious cycle, they walk less, which makes them breathe less deep which leads to decreased pulmonary function, which leads to less walking, whoops, which leads to less walking, less deep breathing, and decreased pulmonary function. So there's all sorts of breathing exercises. They don't have time to go over it, but this is one of my favorite breathing exercises. I urge everyone to try this when you're done with the uh, seminar, and it's very, very simple. You take in a deep, slow breath, Okay, and then once the breath is as deep as you can, you slowly exhale, exhale, excuse me, while trying to make an ah sound. So deep breath in, ah, and you hold that for as long as possible. If you can keep it up for under over 20 seconds, that's excellent. Your breathing's in pretty good shape. If you're between 15 and 20 seconds, you're still pretty good, although the closer 20 you get, the better. If you're at 10 to 15 section, seconds, that's okay, but at 10 seconds, you should be worried. If you're under 10 seconds, get to work. Okay? And what, what's the work you do? This exercise right here. Do this four or five times a day. If you're not getting to 20 seconds right away, keep practicing it until you do. So, how are we doing on time? Good. So, summary, um, exercise is beyond vital for persons with MS. If you're not on a good aggressive exercise program, even during the summer, you're not really fighting MS with all the tools you have. But during the summer, it does get harder, no question about it. 
and it's been a challenge for many, many of my patients. And I've been working with them to try and keep them as physically active as they can during the summer using a lot of the techniques I showed here. These specific can techniques can be used to make exercise easier in the summer for persons with MS. So I'm gonna stop chatting right now and I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, and I'll take whatever questions or comments you have. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Karpatkin. Now we, we are ready for questions. If you have a question or a comment, please use the raise hand feature in the app uh, or send your questions via chat. To raise your hand, click on the screen to pull up the menu, select more, it's the icon with the three dots, and click raise your hand. I'll unmute you, then a button will appear on your screen asking if you want to allow uh, me to do that. So if you want to go ahead and select now, or if anyone has any um, questions, please go ahead and ask. Uh, Dr. Karpatkin, you had mentioned our cooling program yes. um, at, the, at the foundation. We do have a very specific time of the year which people can apply for that, which is between February and June. So that program's actually, for applications right now, is actually closed. Now, sometimes we can help with additional things, but we do have, um, uh, but the official time to apply for that is, is in that time period so people can have the jackets and cooling devices by summer. Um, but if, if someone does need something uh, in an emergency, please reach out to us. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, msfocus.org, or you can uh, give us a call at 888-673-6287. Um, we don't have any questions uh, uh, yet. Let me, let me see from KC coming in. How do you know how long to rest when doing intermittent exercise? Um, that's really one of the key questions. And the problem, of course, is, is that it depends. It depends on many things. Um, you a lot of my patients tell me they develop a sense for it. Um, if you feel like you're still too tired, then you're probably not ready to go. On the flip side, you don't want to rest there for 15, 20 minutes. So usually it's in the two to four minute range, um, but it's also going to depend on other things, how hard you were exercising and how hot the room that you're exercising is in. So if you take breaks with a combination and combine it with cooling, the breaks will probably be shorter. Generally, I don't like to give my people breaks of longer than five minutes because their body might actually start to tighten up. So it's usually in the two to four minute range. Okay, another question from Karen. What is the best exercise? Squats, SLR, I'm not sure what that is, or weights at gym? Um, well, I hate to say this, but the answer to that is it depends. Um, uh, squats um, are usually a little bit more difficult in exercise because it's body weight um, and it works on balance a little bit. Um, they're better for calorie burning. Um, also, straight leg raises can sometimes lead to some back pain. But the question is, what do you want to do with the exercise? Um, what do you need that strength for? One reason I really like squats is they're very similar to a sit to stand. And so um, people who do a lot of squats, a squat is very basically a type of sit to stand exercise. So I suppose if I was forced to choose, I would choose a squat, but it would really depend on what the patient needed at the time. Okay, from Herb, can you recommend exercise for foot drop? That is the, uh, one of the best questions you could ask. So foot drop is a combination of three things. One, tightness of the gastroc muscles, the muscles of the calf, weakness of the muscles in the front of the shin, and lack of practice of walking. I'm going to go back to my slides here, because I actually showed some exercises. So this calf stretch exercise is probably one of the first things you should do. 
what you see this fellow doing is uh, putting a towel or a strap or a scarf around the ball of his foot and then pulling that towards him and he's holding it there for as long, you know, hopefully for at least 30 to 60 seconds. And then after he would do that, I would say practice lifting the front of your foot up. And then after that, practice walking, making sure you land on the right heel and push off from the right toes. But you have to do it a lot. You know, you have to do the stretching a couple minutes every day, no matter what. Okay, our next question is from Deborah. Can you suggest a short dynamic warm up to follow prior to exercise? Um, it, again, it's going to depend on what you're trying to do. The simplest rule for a warm up, and I, I just say this because I get this question a lot, is do your regular exercise program, but at like, you know, 25 to 50 percent effort. You know, you know, do what you normally you know, So say you were going to do this low back stretch as one of your exercises. Practice by just maybe moving, say, a quarter or a half way through the range of motion. So, so do your warm up exercises as your regular exercises, but do them slower and less intensively and more gently. A question somewhat from Fran, it's, um, she, she says, more stretches, question mark, I'm tight even though I do stretches. Well, how, it's going to depend on how long you stretch for. And I'm wondering, so tightness in MS can occur for a lot of reasons. One could just be because you're not using your muscles, you're not stretching your muscles enough. But another can be because of a condition that's very common in MS called spasticity. And if you have spasticity, which is a tightness in your muscles that's not due to the muscle, but due to abnormal signals being sent from your brain and or spinal cord to your muscle, that is a medical issue. So if that's the case, you may want to check with your doctor to see if spasticity is part of the problem. But persons with MS, particularly long-standing MS, their muscles can get very tight. And stretching really becomes essential for them. Um, when I'm done with this talk today, I'm gonna to go see a patient and she really needs an enormous amount of stretching done by me and done by herself to be able to walk around. If she doesn't do the stretching, the walking is much harder for her. Okay, uh, from, let me see, from Deepa, what is the best exercise to improve balance? Wait. Everyone's asking me these best exercise questions. <laughs> there is no best exercise. It's sort of like saying, what's the best medicine? It depends on what's wrong with you. So balance is the, the question I would ask Deepa is, what is making you lose your balance? Normally what I do is I go through a test which has patients move through various progressively more difficult balance positions. So first I'll start by just having them stand normally and see what their balance is like. Then I might ask them to bring their feet all the way together, touching in the center, and see how that affects their balance. Then I may ask them to close their eyes and see how that affects their balance. Then I might ask them to stand heel to toe and see how that affects their balance. Whatever it is they have trouble with, that's what we practice. So say I have a patient who, when their eyes are open, their balance is good, but if they close their eyes, their balance is bad. And if they close their eyes and bring their feet together, touching in the center, their balance is worse. That's the exercise we practice. You practice balance with your eyes closed. So you learn how to balance without visual input. Okay, from Roya, uh, how do you, uh, do you recommend Pilates as an exercise? Um, Pilates is an exercise that was created predominantly for dancers. And it's a way of building both flexibility and strength in a muscle. Um, I have some patients who use Pilates and, uh, and have found it helpful. I have more patients who've used Pilates and have not found it helpful because it might have been too hard or it might have been 
uh, not really address their specific MS issues. Pilates has a very specific goal. MS does not present in one specific way. People can have different levels of weakness, tightness, sensory loss, and it could be in their arms, their legs, their hips, their knees, their calf muscles. So there's no cookie cutter exercise for MS. There's no one size fits all. If your Pilates instructor has some background in MS and they know how to adapt the MS program for you, that's fine. My experience with Pilates and MS has not been great. I just don't think it's the, uh, the uh, specific thing that people with MS need and could benefit from. All right, from Karen, do you ever see foot drop go away and your thoughts on new step? Do I ever see foot drop go away? Yes, I do, but it, they have to, if the foot drop's been there for 25 years and nothing's been done about it, that's gonna be pretty hard. If on the other hand, people have been, are just noticing that the foot's starting to drop, that's a time where if you work really hard, you can slow it down or even reverse it. But the longer you've been going at it without any specific uh, interventions for it, the harder it's gonna to be to fix it. But have I ever seen it? Yes. Would I like to see it more? Oh yes. But it's a very dose dependent phenomenon. If you don't stretch enough, you're not gonna get the improvements that you need. And uh, the second part of the question were your thoughts on New Step? Oh, New Step, that's like a type of a uh, stationary bike, I believe. Um, um, the, if the question answer can tell me, is that what she's referring to? Uh, that was just, uh, part, just, I get your thoughts about the, the product maybe. Yeah. Um, let me, I'm just gonna look at my notes for a moment, make sure I know what we're, that we're talking about the same thing. Sure. And, um, we, we are getting a lot of questions, um, just as a side note about getting a copy of the slides. Uh, for those who are participating in today's Zoom, um, we do. Uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel for MS uh, uh, MS Focus um, at the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation YouTube channel. So you can do a search. It'll be ready in a couple of weeks. I don't know if Dr. Kropatkin, if there's a place where these slides might be available for people to print out. Uh, if people want to email me directly. Um, I'll send them to them. Okay. Can you share your email? Sure will. H E R B K A R P T T at gmail.com. Can you repeat that just in case people? Sure. H is in Henry, E is in Edward, R is in Robert, B is in Boy, K is in Kevin, A is in Andrew, R is in Robert, T is in Peter, T is in Peter again, T is in Thomas at gmail.com. All right. And um, the back to uh, going back to the new step. Yeah, the new step is a type is a is a type of uh, kind of high end recumbent bike um, where you can control the amount of resistance um, for gaining fitness, cardiovascular fitness, leg strength. I think it's really great. Um, uh, the one uh, reason I don't like it though is that. Um, if you're having trouble with walking, the new step is not gonna help you that much because when you're on the new step, you're not practicing walking, you're practicing riding a recumbent bike. Okay? You only get good at what you practice at. So it's a very good exercise device. A lot of my patients use it and like it, but it's going to help your fitness, it's gonna help your cardiovascular response, it's gonna help with weight loss, probably not going to have much of an effect on walking or balance. All right. We have about five minutes left. Um, if you do have a question, uh, please make sure you submit it in the group chat or by uh, using the raise your hand feature uh, so I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Um, let's see here. Uh, Fran had a question about recumbent bikes uh, that you just answered, I believe. And let's see, Mary um, has a question. So Mary, I'm gonna unmute you and then you will get a request to, to um, 
uh, to ask a question. Whenever you get a chance, you go ahead, Mary. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I was just wondering about your opinion about a Qigong program. Um, that's a good question. I have one patient in particular who is a big believer in it. He says it's helped him a lot. Um, you know, I'm a scientist by nature, so scientists are essentially skeptics. Um, on the other hand, if my patients tell me that something is working for them, then I encourage them to do it. The flip side of that is that some patients try it and it doesn't help them. And uh, they, the time spent on it um, is time that they've lost. Why does it work for them? Because like, this patient of mine is someone I've been working with on and off for over 20 years now. Um, my guess is it, it puts, it's very meditative for him. Um, and I think it, uh, the meditative aspects of it, of it are very, very helpful for him. It helps uh, calm him down, lower his body temperature, lower his, uh, his level of anxiety. So I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, right now, I'd say it's a mixed bag. There's certainly have come across people who say it's been it's been part of their whole program. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. If um if there are any more questions, we do have a couple of more minutes. Please uh, submit them via chat or uh, click the raised hand feature, and then I'll unmute you for any questions. I don't see any others in here uh, at the current moment. Is there? I do have a question as far as your. Uh, how people can find outside of your email, how people might be able to connect with you uh, via social media or any of uh, any of. Um, I'm trying my hardest to put together a new web page. Um, uh, I would think during this time of quarantine, I'd have more time to work on things like this rather than less, but it hasn't quite happened. Um, I have no trouble. Um, I my, my job is to help people with MS. If you have questions for me, email me and I'll answer you. Yeah, and uh, Casey was uh, kind enough to to add your email into the um, oh, in the chat. So if anyone's looking to for specifically uh, how to spell or or get uh, Dr. Kropatkin's email, you can certainly look uh, in the chat and find that. Um, there is a question, Taichi Wan, for better balance from Fran, I believe. Sure. Um, that is something that's been studied quite a bit, and there's no question that practicing Tai Chi improves balance. Um, it's been studied in various populations, not just MS, but Parkinson's, stroke, older adults, Alzheimer's. Um, because of the nature of the movement, perhaps the me meditative aspect, the learning to move slowly, mindfully, carefully, there's no question in my mind that it helps. Um, I've taken some classes in it, so I teach it. Um, I must admit, it, um, watching me teach Tai Chi is pretty funny looking because I'm. when Tai Chi was created, I was not the kind of person they had in mind. But nevertheless, the idea of the slow moving, the slow weight shifts, the, the using your whole body to move, very effective. Big believer. All right. Well, you know what? I, I don't see any... Um... Any other questions? Wait, let's see. One last one. Thoughts on stim for foot drop at home? Sure. Um, so I don't know if you're talking about just simply using an electrical stimulation device um, or using one of the what are called the neuroprostheses, the bioness or the uh, gate right. Um, the stim at home. Um, it's not gonna hurt whether it's gonna have a huge impact. I'm not sure. I have not seen it in my practice. Um, the use of neuroprostheses such as the Bioness um, look pretty good to me. Um, you have to use it as part of an entire program. You have to make sure that you, that you fit the protocol for the program. But I have many patients who use them and they get good results from them. Uh, that being said, I know some patients who were sold one when they really were not appropriate for them and they were out the money 
So it's not a decision to be taken in a cavalier way. You should be looking pretty carefully um, and speaking with your physician or physical therapist before you spend the money on it. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirpatkin. That's uh, all the time we have for now. If, if you missed any part of this conference, it will be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or our YouTube page. That's where you'll be able to see all the slides uh, as well. Please remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Um, and also, if you have any needs, please give us a call at 888-673-6287. That's 888-MS-FOCUS. Um, uh, during the week, we are available. And uh, we have another Zoom program coming Monday, June 15th at 3 p.m. with Julie Warwick. And it's about laughing your stress away with MS. Our sincere thanks to all the attendees for your participation, and especially to Dr. Kropatkin. Thank you so much for the time and energy that you spent to prepare and share this information with us. Glad to do it. Uh, best of luck to you all, and feel free to contact me if I can be of some help.